And next talk is by uh, Sam Haddon, who's going to speak about the production of free floating planet via dynamical instabilities. And Sam is from uh, CETA, Toronto University. Tess, all right. everybody hear me? Great, thanks. Should I make sure this works? Big deal. Yeah, yeah. all right, great. Uh, all right, uh, so I, first I wanna say thank you to the organizers for the opportunity uh, to talk to you today uh, about some ongoing work uh, in collaboration with Yan Chen Wu at University of Toronto on producing free floating planets via dynamical instabilities. Um, so to start, uh, I want to start in our own solar system. So a particularly popular and successful model uh, for the solar system's formation and evolution is the so-called Nice model. And in at least one variant uh, of this model, it's thought that our own giant planets started initially in a more compact configuration uh, due to migration in a protoplanetary disk. And then at the time uh, that the gas disk dispersed, uh, the orbits of this configuration or the orbits in this configuration were dynamically unstable. And so uh, they went through a phase of orbit crossing um, to form with an initial extra giant planet, I should say, or ice giant. Uh, and then this dynamical instability uh, quickly led to the ejection of one of these extra ice giants uh, via scattering off of Jupiter. Uh, and Uranus and Neptune were kicked out to their modern day orbits in this um, scenario. And so the reason that uh, this sort of dynamical instability leads to an ejection rather than a collision uh, is because of the so-called Safranov number of uh, Jupiter and the other giant planets. Uh, this is the ratio of the energy required to escape from a planet's surface relative to the energy required to escape from the sun's potential well at uh, that planet's orbital location. And so planets with Safranov numbers less than one, like our own Earth, can't pick things that they scatter uh, up to sufficient velocities to get them out of the sun's potential well. And so anything that they scatter will eventually end up crashing into them. Uh, that's why, for example, we have our moon uh, due to a collision. By contrast, Jupiter and the other giant planets can kick things out um, because they can impart enough energy uh, to get them out of the sun's potential well. And I think one of the things that's really exciting about Roman is that it will, for the first time, be probing this sort of new dynamical regime for small planets, especially, where uh, Safranov numbers are greater than one, and so we should be probing small planets that will be scattering things out of their system rather than uh, leading to collisions. So this is a, a fairly well-worn uh, plot at this point in the conference showing planet discoveries to date in the space of semi-major axis versus mass, along with projected Roman discoveries. Uh, and what I've added to this plot is a series of lines of uh, where the Safranov number is unity, so that planets sitting above these lines should be able to kick things out of their host system, uh, whereas planets below the line will uh, result in collisions. And you can see, even for a solar mass star, a healthy fraction of projected Roman discoveries sit above this line. Uh, when you keep in mind that many of the host stars uh, that Roman will be searching for planets around uh, will be less massive than the sun, you see that a lot of the discoveries will be in this regime where instabilities should culminate in ejections rather than collisions. Um, okay, so another important point to bear in mind when thinking about dynamical instabilities and ejections in the sorts of systems that Roman will be probing is that Jupiter mass planets are relatively rare. Uh, we know from radial velocity surveys, for example, that something like only 10% of sun-like stars host Jupiter-mass planets or Jupiter-scale planets within about 10 AU. 
uh, and for the sort of smaller mass Mdorf hosts that Roman will be probing, this fraction is even lower. And this is corroborated by uh, microlensing detections as well. Uh, so this is a nice plot taken from Suzuki et al. 2016, uh, sort of showing all the occurrence rate information that has been derived from various sources. And if you look at 10 to the minus three, where Jupiter sits, um, the, the relative frequency or relative occurrence of Jupiter mass planets is fairly low. Um, and so we saw in that solar system example, that Jupiter made rather quick work of chucking out this extra ice giant planet. Um, but by contrast, if you have systems of lower mass planets, they can really take a long time uh, to eject anything out of the system. So this uh, plot that I'm showing here is a numerical simulation where I've taken a system of five Neptune mass planets and arranged them initially on compact circular orbits uh, with a little bit of mutual inclination uh, in a way arranged in such a way that they go unstable after a few uh, hundred thousand orbits or so. And you can see after they go unstable, um, I should say what I'm plotting here is the semi-major axes as, as solid lines. And then these sort of colored extents extend from the pericenter to apocenter. So it's a sort of radial extent of each orbit. Um, but you can see shortly after instability, they enter this prolonged phase of sort of violent scattering where uh, most of the planets get kicked out. And then as a consequence of energy conservation, uh, this one planet gets kicked in uh, closer to the star, sort of absorbing the energy of everything else that's scattering. Uh, and you can see that it takes uh, tens of millions of years before any sort of ejection occurs. And at, at a hundred, I should say, uh, not years, but rather orbits. Um, and then it takes up to a hundred million orbits or even at a hundred million orbits, you're left with um, four planets still scattering around. And so I've scaled the time axis here to be in units of the initial orbital period. So if you're thinking of things starting at 10 AU around a solar mass star, this is already pushing into nearly a billion years of scattering without any ejections or without many ejections. Um, and so what this simulation and other simulations show is that the sort of dissolution time scales for planetary systems is really a strongly mass dependent uh, phenomenon. And so here I'm showing a sort of summary of ensembles of a hundred integrations like the ones I just showed where I've set up initially circular systems and let them go unstable and eject planets uh, for three different mass regimes. So like uh, I showed in the last plot or last system, uh, these are systems of five initially Neptune mass planets, and then uh, three times Neptune mass up to 10 times Neptune mass, which is half a Jupiter mass. Um, and what I'm recording is just the average number of bound planets in each system uh, as a function of time after they first become initially orbital crossing. And you can see that the, the lowest mass ones are still decaying after hundreds of millions of orbits or billions of years if you're thinking about things beyond 10 AU or so. Um, and so you can actually sort of work out theoretically what the, the predicted scaling of this ejection time scales or, or what sort of time scale this dynamical processes take place on. It goes roughly as the planet to star mass ratio squared. Um, so you can see this illustrated in these two dash curves, which are just copies of this solid line uh, for the Neptune mass case shifted over appropriately by scaling uh, time scales. And this is sort of analogous. You can make an analogy to scattering in the circular restricted three body problem where this, this mass ratio scaling is fairly well understood. Um, so you know, from this, we can conclude that many of, um, okay, well, I should say that the scattered planets uh, that do remain bound get kicked quite far out. Um, if you look at what at the end of these simulations, uh, if you look at the projected separations of planets that remain bound are, they're kicked out to about 10 to 100 times their initial formation location. Um, so this is just a cumulative distribution from each ensemble at the end of these integrations uh, <clears throat> for those that remain bound, excluding the one that got kicked in closest. Um, and so it stands to reason that if there's a lot of low mass 
planetary systems out there, uh, the apparent free-floating planet detections of Roman will often frequently be um, bound planets as well, or actually bound. Um, and then one other interesting feature of this, this sort of scattering dynamics playing out over long timescales is that it can drive planets onto very close pericenter passages. So this is that simulation that I showed earlier. Uh, and you can see that this innermost planet especially uh, has goes through multiple periods where its pericenter is driven well below uh, the plotted range here. And actually, um, if you look in these ensembles of integrations, what the distribution of the smallest pericenter uh, distance is reached by planets, you can see that there's a strong dependence on planet mass again. Uh, and roughly speaking, the reason is because these smaller planets, uh, because they hang around for longer in the scattering phase, they have more time to sort of random walk in angular momentum onto these very low angular momentum orbits where they do these deep pericenter uh, plunges. Um, so I, I didn't, these are very idealized simulations where everything's just a point mass and they're not exactly physically self consistent. Uh, but if you take sort of fiducial numbers for, say, again, a 10 AU starting radius, you see that in this lowest mass ensemble, uh, things are being driven on to distances where uh, almost all of them would crash into the host star. Uh, and another interesting thing to keep in mind is that uh, even in the higher mass cases, uh, the majority of planets will send something in inside of um, about 0.10U if you're thinking about a typical transiting sub-Neptune's uh, system, which or that's rather, that's where typical sort of transiting sub-Neptune systems sit. Uh, and we know that those are fairly common occurrences around sun-like stars. Uh, and so, you know, I think Roman will give us lots of interesting constraints on how this can be uh, playing out around the stars uh, that we see. And, and you know, how do we square the fact that we have lots of transiting sub-Neptune systems uh, with the possibility that these scattering dynamics can be playing out uh, around host stars? Okay, uh, so I'll just uh, quickly conclude with uh, some takeaways. Um, so I think Roman is gonna be great for both detecting the population of kicked out free-floating planets uh, and the planets that do the kicking. Um, and, you know, assuming as it seems now uh, from both radial velocity and microlensing surveys that higher mass planets are relatively rare, uh, it's worth keeping in mind that ejections by low mass systems can take over a billion years or more. And so uh, there could be lots of apparently free floating planets that are actually bound. Um, and then uh, thinking about the consequences of the fact that the scattering process can uh, cause planets to develop very extreme eccentricities will be uh, something to bear in mind. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. Question for Sam. Matthew. So would you say with the, the plot of a Safranov number on the mass semi-major axis plot, are, are you essentially predicting the number of free-floating planets by, or if you had a distribution of planets in that diagram, are you then able to predict a, a distribution of free-floating planets as well? Or is that um, too many steps? No, I, I think, I think, well, Maybe another way to put it is that with the detection of the population of free floating planets, we'll have a sort of sense of how prevalent they are, and we'll get to see the stuff that they left behind. Um, so, you know, one thing that's worth pointing out is that, right, it's very straightforward to sort of predict this final semi major axis of this innermost planet just based on conservation of energy. So if you know the sort of typical number and masses of things that get kicked out and you see what's left behind, you can figure out where things started in a statistical sense, at least by just sort of conservation of energy. Um, so I, I think uh, you can tie the two populations together. Um, yep, yeah, here. So, so this simulations presume 
you can form the initial system, right? Right. Um, it, is there any concern that 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 you don't kick things out early on that prevent you forming these compact systems that become un unstable? Is there concern that you like 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 it, it, is this a realistic sy system that actually could form like this and then go unstable in the first um, place? Well, I, I think it's certainly plausible uh, that you know if, if planet formation is fairly efficient that you make more planets than can stay stable long term uh, around a star. Um, I mean, that's sort of the thinking, for example, in the solar system with the Nice model. And, you know, people have pointed this out for transiting Kepler like systems where you see today's population has a lot of things that look like they're sort of right on the edge of being unstable over the for time scales approaching like billions of years which you know, is sort of taken as a hint that in the past, they had more planets and were sort of whittled down until they became uh, stable. So that's, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a plausible scenario for how planets form and will be testable based on the sort of detections, what we detect, I guess, in terms of free floating planets and bound stuff, yeah. All right, let's thank Sam's uh, again. Thank you.